Welcome to this webinar hosted by SA Accounting Academy, creating opportunities to connect our partners to succeed. Our CPD policy is compliant with IFAC IES 7, which is the international standard set by the International Federation of Accountants, which relates to continuing professional development. Subscribers also gain access to various rewards. These rewards include discounts, reduced premiums and other free stuff which is accessible through your online profile. These are our reward partners. The webinar recordings, slides, additional material and assessment will be available at the end of the webinar within your online profile. You can claim your CPD for this webinar at the end of the webinar through your online profile after you have successfully completed the associated assessment. Whilst every effort has been made to ensure the accuracy of the presentation and handouts, the pre presenters, authors and organizers do not accept any responsibility for any opinions expressed by the presenters or author, the contributors or correspondents, nor for the accuracy of any information contained in the handouts. Copyright of this material rests with SA Accounting Academy and the documentation or any part thereof may not be reproduced either electronically or in any other means whatsoever without the prior written permission of SA Accounting Academy. Feel free to ask your questions during the webinar in the chat. These will be addressed in the formal Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for everybody joining us. I know that it's a, a chaotic time of the year um, and we are down to that last week where I think we are all digging deep, uh, finding inner reserves that we we sort of pull out every once in a while. And, um, you know, it, it means everything to me that you've, you've taken the time to be here. Today's session is actually quite a, uh, dare I say, just a little bit of a, a, not an easier session, but one that isn't so technical. It's, it's a little bit of a softer session. But I hope that it gets you thinking. It might make you squirm a bit. Um, I was running a similar session live yesterday, which... Ethics Live is just a different beast. It's a it's a different animal because you get conversation and you get you get to stare people in the face and see their reactions and definitely a bit of shuffling on the on the chairs because when you stare into the abyss, um, as it were, when you actually stop in the chaos of life and you just take some quiet time to sit and think um, and to to reflect um, about where you are in your life right now. Um, and we forget sometimes as professionals that there's this whole person that's attached to us. Um, it can sometimes be a little bit uncomfortable. And there's some realizations that we have that, oops, we can do better. And I think that's the whole point of this is to be aware, okay? Um, and to be conscious of the decisions we're making. So sometimes we are, you know, the, the choices are bad or worse. And um, sometimes the choices aren't easy or good. Um, they're not obvious, um, they are a challenge, and there's no easy outcome for, for what we're faced with. But at least we're aware of whether or not we've made the best choice with what we have available, and we're very aware of where we're standing in the entire situation. Okay, so that is where we are at. Um, we have a, a quite a bit of time today to talk about this. I'm not sure if we'll go all the way to two o'clock. I mean, two o'clock, listen to me. You will suddenly freaked out. Um, if we go all the way to 11 o'clock. Uh, but then again, I've been known to talk for days on this. Um, so I really am looking forward to comments. I'm looking forward to observations. Um, any thoughts that you may have, disagree with me, I welcome debate. Uh, but this is, this is sort of a, a journey. I've been working with ethics. I won't say teaching ethics. I've been working with ethics for about 14 years now, and I really and tru truly love this topic because no two sessions are the same. I can use the exact same slides year on year, and no two sessions will ever be the same. The hardest thing for me with this is actually setting your assessments, because how do you assess an assessment which is actually a soft skill um, that you're looking at? Okay, so 
just to do some of the admin, please, this is definitely a session I want to be interactive. This is definitely a session um, I'm wanting to engage with you. I want your thoughts. Uh, give me examples. Give me challenges you faced. Um, and you can always say asking for a friend or my friend had this situation. And we will all nod and say, yes, absolutely. Whether it's you or your friend, we'll, we'll take it like that. You can always say Billy and Bob and Betty had the situation and we'll take that as well because ethics can be quite personal. I always feel very exposed when I do ethics training and um, I've learned to get comfortable in that space because in order for me to have any sort of um, ground to discuss it, I have to open myself up and, and show that um, I, I, I mean and, and I walk and talk the talk. Okay. So again, for any newcomers, um, by this stage, I wonder if there are any SAAA uh, delegates that don't know me. Um, but for any newcomers, um, this is who and what I am. Um, so please feel free to go have a look at my bio. Um, I'm starting to wonder whether or not I've got the right slide. Sorry. Um, anyway, we'll have a we'll have a gander um, through these. So this is a four-part session, um, possibly five-part, I'm not too sure. Um, and this is really the second of the, the sessions. We did uh, ethics in the accounting profession last week. Today, we're doing personal ethics. We'll go on and do a session on business ethics. We'll go on and do another session on, on professional ethics. And I actually just have to check the calendar whether or not we're doing prof uh, professional citizenship. Okay. Um, Anita, there is a overlap between a lot of them, but we're going into a lot more detail than we did last week. So last week, the slides were, um, and as we said, there was a couple of glitches um, earlier, but they aren't exactly the same slides and the discussion will be different, okay? Just as the assessment is different. So it is going to be a part of a series. Last week was an overview session, okay? So yes, there was a lot that we discussed and there are a few people online that weren't last week, so there is going to be a little bit of overlap, but I'm hoping that today we have more time just to settle into it and to talk about it. Um, I'm also going to bring you things that I mentioned last week, but in more detail, because we don't have to rush it this week. Okay. Um, so I've also been talking to others about this. Now, I want to come back to this quote, and I did mention and pull it out last week, because... It really, you know, the more I look at this quote, the more um, it makes me realize exactly where we are. We, we live in a world of duality. We live in a world with the positive and the negative. And it really is our perspective of the world as to where we linger and where we choose to, you know, what lens we choose to look through the world at. I call myself a grounded optimist, and I, I, I tend to get a lot of flack from a lot of colleagues and a lot of people when I say that I'm an optimist, especially when I'm looking at South Africa and looking at um, the state of the world at the moment. You know, how can you be optimistic? How can you be encouraged? How can you be, um, you know, looking for the silver linings and looking for the positives? But that's just my natural setting. I have to be that way. That's the that's my reality and my grounding. Um, I say grounded because I'm not oblivious to the challenges. I'm not li living in cloud nine and just sort of thinking that the world is roses and butterflies and unicorns. I'm very, very aware of the war in Ukraine and the suffering that's happening. I'm very, very aware of the challenges in our own country. I'm very aware of the, the steep climb we have to get to, to get to the other side. The difference is that I believe we can get there. Okay, I have to believe we can get there. Otherwise, what's the point? I believe that um, each one of us have to work towards a solution rather than being part of the problem. And to me, that's that's an element of ethics because you want a better society. You want to live in a happy community. You want people to work together in a way that everybody benefits. Everybody feels good about each other. You want to do good and be good and make the right decisions and the best decisions that you can. But in a world where, yes, it's the best of the times and it's the worst of times, it's the age of wisdom, and it's the age of foolishness. 
Um, we can never argue that wisdom, you know, knowledge is the problem when we have all the knowledge at our fingertips, but still we have people with the, you know, coming to the strangest conclusions. So when we look at our belief system and who our natural setting is, so, so one of the other things I think you have to be aware of is what is your natural setting in terms of your personality and, and the type of person you are? Um, I mean, I laugh with my husband. We always have this conversation. He always says he's a realist. Um, and I don't know if any of you have heard the black, the six hat management theory where it says, you know, to, to bring around a table and, and something I should actually bring into business ethics next week. I think it's quite useful, especially when you look at diversity, is to say that at the table, you, you'll have six different people with six different approaches. One of those people are going to be the creative optimist. Um, and one of them is going to be a black hat. And that black hat is going to be the one that sees every problem, every challenge, every issue. But then the rest of the table need to find solutions for those challenges and issues. So there's always a duality in life. Okay. And part of, of awareness is to know where you come from and what perspective you come from. Um, because that's then how you know how you plug into the matrix and how you work. Now, with ethics training, and particularly with per uh, personal ethics, I am not here to teach you. I am not here to dictate to you what is right or wrong. Um, I'm wrestling with what's right and wrong every day of my life. Um, I have my compass, and I have I, I have an, you know my my idea of what is right. But when you overlay that into the world that we live in and you overlay that into the challenges that we face it's it's not always the easiest thing to navigate now we'll talk quite a bit today about how you got to this particular point in your journey how you got to where you are sitting right now at your desk listening to me um what experiences what influences have created you and created your your moral conscience and the state it's in right now but i can't teach you right from wrong now that ship has sailed the jesuit priests have a saying that say that give me a child until he's seven and he's mine for life okay that early imprint is is critical okay it's 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 the heart and the the, the depth of your subconscious the social scientists sort of said, no, well, seven is a bit late. You know, they, they considered it five. And then they actually did a lot of research to come back and say that your base of your morality. So the, the thing that, that magnetizes your compass, okay, is set at the age of three. So at three years old, we learn to lie. At three years old, we learn that there are things that are right and things that are wrong. And if we do things that are wrong, we're going to get into trouble. So we need to navigate out of that wrong space into the right space. Um, and that may necessitate telling a lie. And although lying is wrong, we don't want to get into trouble. So by the fact that we lie to get out of trouble means that we understand right and wrong in our own perspective. Okay, that's set at three. Every parent shudders um, when you sit down and look at your kids. I mean, I was, I was just saying to Jeremiah, I'm having a chaotic day today because my son just turned 13. So, you know, you suddenly start to realize that as we get into the teenage years, we're really hoping that the work that we've done over the last 13 years, um, we've entrenched something in there so that now that, that compass needs to start to be activated so that when our external forces start coming, um, hopefully they, they know what we're thinking and they know what, you know, their compass will start helping them navigate the challenges that they're going to start facing. But the other thing about children and getting growing up to where you are now, and when we start start thinking about now and our influences from then, is and I and I know that I'll be using you know parenting analogies quite a bit, but there there is a lot to be said for it. One of the things that um, if you sit and listen and, and um, listen to your, your friends and families and that and how they talk to their kids, and if you reflect back on your own childhood, we all have an inner voice. We all have a little voice, whether it's a, a voice on our shoulder, a voice somewhere, a little inner voice that, that speaks to us at three o'clock in the morning. And that inner voice, um, if you speak to psychologists and you speak to um, the people in those type of fields, they will tell you that the inner voice you carry into adulthood 
is your parents' voice. Okay, it's it's the you know if your parents if you got home with a test and your parents were saying, "Well done, we're so proud because you you did well, and you you gave it your best." You know, you're going to be confident that well, so long as I give my best, that's good. If you got home with that test when you were younger and your parents said, "Well, you know, why did you get a B plus? Why didn't you get an A?" That's not good enough. You're going to continually strive because you're going to continually feel potentially like you're not good enough. And I think if you think about this a little bit and you think about, you know, reflect on this, it starts to give you an understanding as well as to how you view things and how you talk about things and how you um, navigate things because your inner voice is very much set by those first words really throughout your childhood that influenced you and, and started to set this conscience and started to set this guard in your mind and inside yourself that that told you whether or not you were doing enough, whether or not you were good enough, whether or not this was right or wrong, or whether or not you felt guilty for doing something because that isn't something we do. But we don't think of it like that. We just think about it as being us. Okay. So when we're faced with circumstances, some of us will naturally see the light and some of us will naturally see the dark. Okay. Um, and we need to consider it. Another point to think about and to, to consider, and I do want to think about this and, and unpack it a little bit more, because one of the things that I think the world is suffering from, and, and definitely there's been write-ups in, um, in articles and all the rest about the South African version of it, is, you know, Blow saying here, one doesn't have to operate with great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding is sufficient. It's the same as that famous quote that came from World War II to say that bad things happen when good men do nothing. Just, we have what I think of as compassion burnout, where don't you find more and more there's this sense of being overwhelmed? There's the sense of, uh, you know, I come from KZN and we kind of tired of being called resilient. Um, the last year has been brutal, I think, to many to many of us around here, because not only have we got out of COVID, then we landed up with the looting, then we landed up with the flooding, and um, we were supposed to have a national strike yesterday, and I found it quite interesting how the taxi drivers said that they were not going to support the strike, and I think it's just too much, too much. Um, I, and I noticed how when South Africans lose their sense of humor, it does tell you a lot about the state of their minds and the state of their, their feelings. But when the looting happened last year, a lot of people could have said, well, I'm staying at home, I'm barricading my house. Um, it's not, you know, as long as I'm safe and my family's safe, I don't have to do anything. But that's not what happened. What happened instead is that communities got together, um, they stood out in the cold, they, they protected communities, they protected homes, they protected businesses, um, because it was the right thing to do. And it wasn't anything about... Um, it was, it was that you were South African, okay? It didn't matter what you looked like or where you came from. You were South African and you came together as South Africans to protect. And a lot of questions were then raised about how people that you never expected were the looters, okay? So where did that come from, okay? Um, and, and a lot of discussion, I think, and a lot of, there's going to be a lot that's going to come out of that situation about thinking about what drove it, what, you know, people's moral compasses. You had some... They could have very easily joined the looters and instead they said no they'll stay at home it's wrong and then others you, you have conversations with people that were looting and they see nothing wrong with what they did nothing wrong with what they did okay um so that that makes us stop and and unpack why is it that some people that are were struggling just as much as the next door neighbor they knew that that was theft. They knew that going and doing that and, and, and behaving in that manner was destructive, it was damaging, it was harmful to the community. Um, whereas the ones that were going looting, it was just, well, the next neighbor's going, I'm not going to lose out. Um, I want, I'm going to get. But where is it, where did we lose the connection there that there was, there was no understanding that the behavior was? wrong okay and um, so here i think we've got great examples where people stand together and help even when nobody's got a gun to their head there's no law that says that they must um but there's a sense of community and there's a sense of this is the right thing to do for my neighbor 
And I think that is when we start to turn the tide and when things start to work. I always have a, another question just, you know, in asking about if you want to sort of do a little bit of a test with your mates and with your friends and your family and your colleagues, ask this question. Do you put the trolley back at the shopping center? How many of you go to the local mall, do your shop? How many of you actually take the trolley back to the trolley bay? And then the question is, for those of you that do, why do you? There's no law that says you must. There's no sign that says you must. What makes you take your trolley back? There's something inside you that tells you that's the respectful right thing to do. Maybe it's because you, you know how irritating it is to turn into a parking spot and have a trolley sitting in front of you. And by taking back to the trolley bay, yes, we South Africans, we have fire guards, okay? <laughs> um, but so some of you might say, well, don't take it back to the trolley bar, but I do hand it to the car guard. Um, but that's, you know, just sort of sit and think about what that actually means. Sit and think about what that actually means. Something, an action as simple as that. So this is the other side to me of ethics. You have this moral system, you have these values inside you, you have the sense of right and wrong. And I don't think we always really sit and think about it. I think so much of our values and our belief system is automatic that we don't question it, but it comes through, it seeps out through our actions. A lot is said in our behavior that communicates and telegraphs to those around us as to what our beliefs are. Okay. And that is quite scary sometimes. It is quite scary sometimes um, about, you know, that you do you are you very aware of how you come across? Are you very aware about the what you're projecting subconsciously? And the message that you're communicating through your opinions and judgments that you that you make um, about what your belief system is. Because it's very easy to say, oh, well, I believe this, but then the next minute you're making a critical remark or a judgment, which actually shows that maybe what you said isn't actually what you believe. Okay. Um, your actions will also speak very loudly. So to me, ethics is a it, it comes through in actions. Okay, it shows in actions. Now, in all of this, because we'll keep on coming back to it, it's got little bits and pieces in all of this, but one of the things that I want to pick up on is your personal brand. Okay, so each of us individually have a personal brand. Each of us individually are operating in the world, social media, in real life, communicating in the written word, texting, talking to people. We are, we are plugged into the communities and plugged into the world and are engaging with people from the way we look, from the way we talk, from the promises we make, from the work we deliver, that creates a personal brand, a reputation, okay? And I'm not just talking professional reputation, I'm talking just generally, how, what are you known as? What are you known for? How do people see you, okay? What do people think of you? Think about Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What is the first chapter in the book? The first chapter in the book says, what will people say about you at your funeral? What is your eulogy going to be? How do you want to be remembered? I actually saw a really good quote. It says, everything that is said at people's funerals need to be said at people's birthday parties instead. Say this while they're alive, not when they're dead. Um, if you had to, you know, my son's gone through a whole lot of interviews for high school and I found one very interesting because they're very much evaluating emotional intelligence. And the question that got asked at every single high school interview he went to was, how will your friends describe you? How will your friends describe you? How do they see you? Do you feel safe asking your friends how they would describe you?
And this is where we start to think about where we are right now. Because I think over time, we, you know, we, we sometimes have an image in our head. We sort of, of course, they would see me as, as this, but is this how you come across? Is this, is, is, are your actions matching what you think people would get from you? And the reason personal brand is so important to me and that individual reputation is so important to me is because we're part of a collective. So when you start looking at business and professional, your brand reflects on my brand because people look at us as accountants. So I need to add and build a strong brand for myself. So because people associate me with being an accountant, so when they look at you, they think, well, this is how Karen is, and now you're also an accountant, so are you the same as Karen? Because we, we are some of the individual, okay? We create, um, create this issue. I don't know if any of you have seen MTS Suleiman's video recently that's making his rounds on social media. Um, and he has a very impassioned call to South African citizens where he says, people have forgotten that the country belongs to the citizens. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to others. It belongs to the individual citizens. And we actually, owe, we actually take ownership of our problems. So if we aren't happy about things, we need to, you know, what can we do in our small space of influence to fix things? And that really rung a bell with me. It really sort of made, took me for a moment because it's so easy to sit in your space and complain about everything going around. But in your small circle of influence, I mean, there are things we cannot control. There are things that we have no control or no influence over. But there are things that we do have influence over. And it might seem small, but it's ripples in the pond. So the kindnesses you show, the empathy you show, the honesty you um, have, the dedication and work ethic that you show, the just in your space, the goodness and the ethics that you profess and that you action, the integrity that you operate by, it makes it hard for people around you to do less when they see you doing more. That's been my belief all along, is that when people see that you're doing it, it makes them look in the mirror for themselves and say, well, if she's doing it, why shouldn't I do it? And if it's possible to be done, I don't have an excuse not to do it. But you don't have to put it all over social media. You don't have to make big song and dances about it. How many of you found in your life that just doing small kindnesses, which always comes back to you in some way, shape or form, karma works in both ways, um, suddenly more good happens around you okay and plus don't you just feel good although doing good deeds um, as Simon Siddick says the dopamine rush only comes when gratitude is shown to you okay the only thing I'm going to talk about in this one for personal ethics is my the impact of digital okay one of the things that makes me question and and again really shows to me where action and words um, are challenged is keyboard ninjas with digital. How easy is it for people to say and be rude and aggressive and um, actually very callous and unfeeling and uncaring when they're sitting behind a screen and behind a keyboard and they're typing things to people? Okay. Could they say that exact same thing or behave in that exact same way if they were face to face with people? So as much as digital is great, as much as remote working and um, you know the technology is fantastic and has helped us in so many different ways, there's a downside to it as well and a dark side to it as well because it actually can bring out the worst in people because there's a lack of accountability. They don't have to see the reaction of the per person's face. They don't have to see how hurtful what they've done has, has been. They don't have to see the consequence of their actions because they're removed from it. Okay. And you know, same with generations. Have you seen how the younger generation battle to have a face-to-face -face conversation? How the younger generation battle to answer a phone call? There's there is a level of intimacy really when you're talking to someone face to face when you're speaking to someone and looking them in the eye and you have that connection with someone 
you have to be a little bit more careful with what you say and how you say it. Um, if you had to say what some people say, their filters just drop. And if they had to say that face to face in the street with someone, there might be a barroom brawl afterwards. Um, but then they also immediately see the consequence of the actions. And I think one of the challenges we have in the world we live with is this distance, is this disconnection from people's actions to the repercussions of the actions. Um, which I think has also created problems and issues um, for various people. I don't know if you agree with me or not, um, or what you're thinking. Okay. I've mentioned this one before, but I, I, so sort of following on from this, we all have the potential to do great deeds. We all have the potential to do good around us. And it doesn't have to, I keep on getting back to this, it doesn't have to be, you know, inventing the latest invention to save the world. Um, I've got you know, I live quite a distance from the main road in a really hilly section. And even if it's simply the fact that I pick up the housekeepers that I know that live in my road, which is at the top of a very steep hill, as I'm driving home, if I have the opportunity to, um, I stop and I, I give them a lift so that they don't have to walk the two kilometers to the house. And I know some of my neighbors do the same thing. So I pick up their ladies and they pick up mine. And, you know, if I'm going back out at the time that, that they're leaving, then I give them a lift to the main road. It's a small kindness, but it means a lot in somebody else's life. Okay. What are the small things you can do? What are the small actions you can do um, to, to live a good life? Okay. Um, people do not seem to realize that the opinion of the world is also the confession of their character. Now, this one, I've had a recent example just to share as to how it can happen and how you have a almost a glimpse into yourself sometimes that you might not have seen. It makes you a bit feel a bit squirmy. Um, as I said, we've got the high school thing going and we were sitting around chatting. I've got an only, so next year he's going off to boarding school. So I've, I'm going to be an empty nester sort of. And I've got another friend of twins, same situation, and a couple of friends that the youngest are going off. And we were looking around each other and asked, and with genuine concern, I made the comment of, I'm really worried about the stay-at-home moms. Now, working versus staying-at-home mom has been an issue for me all along because I've worked and I've traveled. And, you know, since my son was 18 months, I've been on airplanes. And um, he used to tell friends that um, his mommy teaches numbers on airplanes. Um, so to me, I've always had to manage the mom's guilt and everything else about being away. But now I'm starting to see the benefit of it because next year, at least when he's off in boarding school, I'm going to be working um, and distracted and, and have that. And my head was going to, well, what are these poor stay-at-home moms going to do? And I didn't mean it as an insult. I didn't mean it as a criticism to stay-at-home moms. I, I have all the, all the admiration for stay-at-home mom because I couldn't do it. And the mom turned around to me and said, you know, Karen, we actually are quite busy. And she took it to heart. And I suddenly realized that I came across as very judgmental. I came across as, um, and maybe there was something inside me sort of in that, that I had to go home and reflect on. But a comment which I thought was not a bad comment sort of unlocked a lot for me to think about. And it's the same as this idea of boarding. You know, how many people will, you know, the thing itself of going and boarding is one thing, but you know, people have ideas and opinions on it um, as to whether or not it's a good thing, bad thing, you know, but what people think will show a lot about the experience, a lot about their belief system, a lot about um, what they value, okay, um, through the comments they make, okay. So it's very interesting when you sit and actually take the time to listen to what people say, even their throwaway comments. It says a lot about what's going on in their head and their mind and their heart. Now, that's really useful for us when you're engaging with other people, just to stop and pay attention to what they're actually saying and, and look at what they're saying and how they say it, to read into that as to what is going on behind it. And again, be careful because sometimes it is a throwaway comment, um, but you know there can be a pattern that gets created and you start to really see Yes, they profess one thing, but their comments and their actions say something else. Um, and that's when we start to, you know, the gut starts to say, well, maybe this person is somebody to be um, careful of. But put up a mirror and watch out for yourself as well. 
Okay, you might think that you've worked through something and you believe it very, very carefully, but every now and then it might just creep up on you and you need to do a little bit more work and have a little bit more consideration, okay, um, about what that is and what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Um, and that's a, that's a spot to do a bit more work, okay. This to me is, is something that um, I'm reflecting, let me just say, on this whole work culture. I'm trying to get an idea of what I think and feel about all of it. I'm reflecting very much on this cancel culture. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting conversations happening. I think there's a lot of interesting debate happening, which is very healthy. Um, but I really think this is really important, especially for people that are very strong in their opinions, is never let me fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I'm persecuted whenever I'm contradicted. Where is the space nowadays for healthy debate? Where is the space nowadays for you to have an opinion, for me to have an opinion, for us to discuss the, the reason we have those opinions um, and not hate each other because we see life differently? Where is the respect for the fact that you can believe what you want to believe and I can believe what I want to believe, but that doesn't mean that we can't like each other and be friends and, and work things out. And I don't know quite in my space and, and what I'm working with as to how the world has got so divided. And so, um, you know, the people just can't sit down and say, okay, I get this is what you think, but this is what I think. And if you, what you think doesn't affect my life and what I think, you live, you do you, okay? I, I definitely, I'm at the school of tolerance. You do you and be you and be who you want to be, but let me be me and let me be who I want to be and what I want to be and what I believe. But this cancel culture of somebody has something different, somebody believes something different and they are too scared to express that view, too scared to be able to have the freedom to stand up to that view because they're going to get shouted down and cancelled. This makes doing the right thing really difficult. Because if you strongly believe, and you might be the lone wolf howling in the wind, that this, you know, what you're seeing around you is wrong, what you're seeing around you is dangerous, what you're seeing around you is troublesome, and you've got a very strong belief of to why, okay, obviously you're going to have to back that up, you know, um, to stand up and, and profess, okay, this is what needs to be done. So to be a whistleblower um, and to be able to have the moral courage to do that, it's getting harder and harder and more and more difficult when the moment anybody swims against the tide, you literally, you know, it seems like the entire internet comes after you. So to me, one of the, before we can actually start um, calming the storms and sorting the waters out and making the world a bit more of a saner place, the first place is that we have to introduce the ability to have healthy debate. We have to introduce the ability to have healthy conversations with each other, to be curious about each other. So why do you believe that? Where does this come from? Why are you so agitated with what I believe? There's a Denzel Washington saying, which I pull out often, which goes, you know, sometimes your spirit irritates their demons. Why? Okay. Because the truth or the, the facts are what they are. But the way we see them can be very different. It doesn't change our perspective. It doesn't change that I see a square and that you see a circle. Where the truth in the center of all of it is a cylinder. But if we can't hold space to see the other person's perspective, if we can't hold space to acknowledge that there are different realities, that there are different um, ways of looking at the same problem, that my perspective may not be the full perspective, that there, there could very well be things that I don't understand and things that I don't know. And that is, that is sort of giving me only a one side of the idea where there's multiple sides. That that doesn't make us critical and able to, and critical not in a bad sense, and just analyze and evaluate and grow and, and become more aware of things. Now, to me, living in a diverse society like we do, this is even more important because 
I come from a certain background and we'll talk about how that develops. I have certain life experiences. These are the things I know to be true because in my entire life, I've never been exposed to anything other than what I've been exposed to. So to me, this is my truth. It's my truth. Okay. But when I come up across somebody who believes something different because their life experiences and their walk and their journey is different. Honest curiosity, respectful curiosity is such a vital tool. Because maybe with honest and respectful curiosity between the two of us, we can actually finally acknowledge that this is a cylinder and that neither one of us is wrong. We're just coming at it from different angles. And doesn't that mean that the conversation is stronger, that the outcome is better, that we actually see this in more detail and we walk away from the conversation wiser and more empathetic. So empathy is about putting yourself into somebody else's position. Okay. And acknowledging that they have the right to feel that, to be empathetic, not sympathetic, empathetic. Okay. Um, and I think that is something the world is needing very much at the moment. Okay. Any comments? I'm feeling very lonely right now. Um, any thoughts or comments? Is everybody good out there? Okay. So one, some of the things we need to talk about is how is your moral compass formed? What influences you? We I'm bringing into today's session, which I didn't touch. I might have mentioned it, but I didn't actually touch in detail and um, some of the ethical theories. Um, I'm also bringing in to chat about the idea of ethical fading. Okay. Um, so it's it's not just what we went. I've got a little bit more to talk about than we had. Okay. But the entire part of this. So my base in ethics training for accountants and for any profession and any space I go into is that the common denominator, the common denominator and the part that we do not get away from is we start with who we are because it's the people that make up the business. It's the people that make up the profession. And it's knowing your own ethical standpoint. It's knowing your own ethical um, pulse that creates the collective. Okay. So you need to know where you stand. You need to know what you believe. You need to know what is right. You need to understand how you come, how you came to believing that was right. You need to know that there are going to be influences that are going to pull you left and right. They're going to pull your, you know, try and demagnetize your, your compass, try and pull you off course. Okay. And we can sometimes be complacent and let it happen. Sometimes if we're not checking in with ourselves, um, we, st we, we stop seeing what is maybe not so right um, and it becomes our norm. So, you know, I, I came back to the, the old analogy of the, the frog in hot water. You know, if sometimes if we are presented with something and it's so shocking, we go like, that's obviously wrong. We're not touching that with a 10 foot barge pole. That's like the frog that goes into hot water and says, hey, this ain't for me. And they hop straight out. But what happens in life is never that. What happens in life is that you're sitting in tepid room temperature water and then a little thing happens and you go like, okay, well, that makes me a bit uncomfortable, but you know what? It doesn't harm anyone. It's their business, whatever. And then next month, you know, it gets a little bit worse and then it gets a little bit worse. And it's like that temperature in that water that's getting turned up and up and up and up until eventually you are in the hot boiling water that you would have jumped out if they presented to you in the beginning. And unless you're checking in with yourself, at each time the temperature gets of changes or just in that first time the temperature changed and said whoops hang a sec this isn't the place i want to be this these aren't the people i want to associate with this isn't the type of transactional type of scenario that i see myself in i'm starting to feel a bit uncomfortable with this i need to to think about this and, and maybe recalibrate my compass if you don't check in with yourself and be aware of yourself you're going to land up in that hot water and you're going to sit in that boiling hot water and wonder how you got there. Okay. Um, so it's really, really important for us to check in regularly and ask ourselves why, you know, where are we at? What are we thinking? How far have we drifted um, away? And some of us, it happens. Okay. We are human, but we always have an opportunity each day to come back to our true north. Okay. 
So having the right principles are like a compass. They always point the way. And if we know how to read them, we won't get lost, confused, or fooled by conflicting voices or values. So I'm kind of bringing you a couple of ideas here. I'm saying to you, you have to know yourself. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you believe is right and what your principles are. Okay. You keep your mind open to what is going on around you. Be aware of people's different ideas and different perspectives because we can fine tune our compass. We can become more knowledgeable and we can become more aware. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. Okay. But we become aware. Because sometimes knowing what you don't agree with is just as important as knowing what you do agree with. But we also have honest and respectful conversation around what is going on with us. But then at the same time, because we have our true principles, we can navigate through what other people are telling us, what their beliefs are, and stay on the true course, Okay, whatever that might mean to you. It takes a lot of courage, humility, and self-awareness to look at ourselves. Um, absolutely. And then... Your background and circumstances may influence who you are, but you are responsible for who you become. This is part of having a growth mindset. Okay, It's part of having a growth mindset. It's part of being aware that, yes, we are, we are a product of our history. We are a product of our influences. And um, we've all a bit battered and bruised and have walked the path that we've walked to get to where we are in life. But... That does not mean that we cannot evolve further, okay? It also means to me that each day that I meet you, we are possibly in a better or worse space than we were the day before, okay? Maybe you've had an incident yesterday that has turned you in a different direction where you're going, I'm not going to help my neighbors. I'm not going to do this. Why should I? Nobody helped me when I had a situation, so I'm just going to fend for myself. And that's where you are in your journey, other people are going to say, you know what, when I was in that situation, it really felt good to do this, and um, I really like myself for doing that, and I want to do more of that. Okay, so I've got a comment here that says, um, <laughs> if we stay a little bit in the warm water, um, because we're afraid of the opinion of others, um, sorry, I've, my, I need to wear my glasses when I read some of these. Um, that we'll be given about. Uh, okay, um, we stay in the little bit of warm water, uh, as we are afraid of the opinion of others that will be given about us as an individual. Uh, I I absolutely agree with you. It's it's not the the event itself. It's the opinions of others that is the problem. And I've actually got that on my slides just now. Um. To me, this is some of the actions of, uh, you know, the outcomes of good ethics. We'll talk about punctuality and what punctuality means. Um, it's always a hot topic, especially in the work front and all the rest, and even on your personal front. Um, my, and it, this is something that I was raised with and something that that is entrenched in me. And I've often come to question it because my, my, my husband's family are maybe not as uh, fastidious about it as I am so it's, it's sort of one of those things that I'm challenged with often but you know to me I, I was raised in that family that if you were on time you were late and um, my dad literally used to drop me at school half or six in the morning and school only started at quarter to eight just because you know you don't be late um, and we were you know we, my fam well my parents raised us to the the fact that you never keep anybody else waiting you must always wait they shouldn't wait for you um, with this idea that it's respectful of the other person's time. So we were always taught in our family that you must always respect that your actions have consequence to others and you must never have a negative consequence on their life. So, um, and, and sometimes I've, I question that as well with boundaries and, you know, it's very much a people-pleasing type attitude and that's not a healthy one either. So evolution as it happens. Um, but it was always about being respectful to other people's time you know, not having a knock-on effect to them. Um, I heard a different perspective about punctuality recently where it says that it's been respectful to your own commitments. So you made a commitment to be there at nine o'clock and it's actually self-respect to, well, I made this commitment to myself um, and therefore that is why I'm there at nine o'clock. And then there's another school of thought that says, well, if I'm in a meeting and my meeting is running late, 
it's disrespectful to leave this meeting for something that happens into the future because these people are here with me now. My counter argument to that is, well, send a text to the people that you're late for so that they at least can rearrange their time and their work um, so that their life isn't negatively impacted by the fact that you're running late because they might have other things that they need to get to and other appointments that they need to get to and they can't just sit there waiting for you, okay? Um, because then, you know, how does that come across that you think that you are more important than they are? So you can start to see something as simple as being just be on time is not simple, okay? Because a lot of people view it from different perspectives. Work ethic. Now, for me, effort, work ethic, energy, attitude, passion, all of that is the same thing. It's about the fact that I want to, I, I hold myself to a high standard. I hold myself to a standard where I respect myself and I'm aiming, maybe a bit of perfectionist, but I'm aiming for the fact that when you engage with me, when you work with me, when you're in my presence, I am focused on you. I am giving you the best of myself um, and I'm giving, you know, I'm putting my, the best of myself out there. Um, again, respect for myself, respect for you, but also taking pride in who I am and what I am. Um, again, it can go the opposite direction and become a negative thing, but having good work ethic, um, taking effort, uh, having energy, giving attention to people, um, having a positive attitude, uh, being passionate about what you do, uh, makes you firstly just a nice person to be around. Other people will enjoy you and, and be attracted to you, um, but it also, lifts the load and, and makes things lighter if you think about your office or think about your your circle of friends and all the rest when you're when you're with people that um take the effort to check in with you when you're with people that have energy and are passionate and are not always down in the dumps and negative and you actually want to be there okay um it says a lot being coachable so taking criticism in the right way always willing to learn okay being prepared Okay, just, um, although I think the more experience you get in your profession, the more you can wing it, but also just shows, again, respect. Um, it's a mark of an educated man to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. That, to me, is the heart of debate. I can hear you. Simon Sinek has got a brilliant um, video where it says, what we need is more active listening. So we need to, you know, we can hear with our ears, but are we actually listening? Because at the end of the day, that's what most people would want from us in communication. Talk about effective communication. Um, people often listen with the intent to answer, not the intent to hear what's being said. And how many people feel like they're not being heard, even though people are there listening? Because um, people are really, they're, li they're, they're, they're listening with uh, trying to figure out how to answer rather than just acknowledging that this is what this person is saying. Okay. Here's what um, you were commenting on earlier. It is not the thing themselves which trouble us, but the opinions that we have about these things. So if I go back to my example of, of my son going to boarding, I mean, I've been told that I'm, you know, kicking him out the house at 13, that, um, you know, basically, how could I do this? He's my only son. Um, I'm going to cut my relationship with him. This, that, the next thing. So, you know, people, you know, that boarding is bullying and it's this and it's that. And, People have obviously had very bad and negative experiences. Um, we're not a boarding family, but on the flip side, I sit down and think, well, he's going to a very, very good school, um, which has got a good track record with boarding. The boarding establishments are small. Um, he is going to get brothers. He's going to get um, boys that are going to become lifelong friends. He is going to become independent. Um, he is going to learn how to navigate life and get tremendous amount of life skills right down to polishing his shoes um and I think it's healthy for them to I always I've always had a belief as being a mother that you the more you do your job right it's you know the 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 less they need you so I've always said motherhood is stages of grief but then I've got other mothers that are saying no 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 you know they, they their chickens must stay with them um forever and different that so the 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 thing is boarding you know going to a really good school getting a, a world-class education and um, having a wonderful community around them that's the thing but the opinions 
and, and people can come at you hard, okay? It's the opinions that trouble us um, about it. And you've got to have a very clear understanding as to what your values are and what your thought process is to take on what comes at you, okay? Now, these opinions and values are often uncritically held. They're held, handed down from generation to generation to generation. So I can ask you, and you don't, you can, if you want to respond, that's great. It just adds to the conversation. But if you don't, we all have things that we believe that are our ultimate truth. We have things that we believe that are our ultimate truth that we do not question. And if we did question, we would feel like it's sacrilegious. We would feel like we are being, um, you know, we're going against the family to not believe that. And there are things that we believe that we don't even know that we believe that other people look at us a little bit strange and are like, what do you mean that's what you believe and that's what you do? Don't you know that that's like weird? Um, and, you know, often it comes from a religious or community driven belief, but there are quirks in every family. Okay. Some families are superstitious about certain things. Some families, you know, are, are very pedantic about other things. Um, some families are, you know, have, have certain things that when you were a teenager or when you were, you know, a young adult, do you remember a moment where you did something and you know that your parents or your family would have had a fit because it's, it was not done. This was not done. This is not what we, this is not who we, that's often how it comes across. This is not who we are. Okay. And the thing itself might have not have been an issue. Like I said, the thing in themselves are not the issue. It's the opinions that people have of it. Okay. And these things are often developed to a point where the validity is not questioned. And I think often this is where, for example, at varsity and high school, when you peers and, and the outside world starts to influence you, where you sometimes come across something and you go, oh my word, I've believed this all my life and others don't. Okay. Um, this is part of what's built us up to where we are. Okay. The strangest thing is when you become a parent, suddenly you seem to revert. So your subconscious has beliefs. There are things that are in there that you might not even be aware of. And the best way to test it is to say some of these things. And what is the first thing that comes to mind? So before I use these particular ones, and I actually want you to think about this on your own, please don't share it because I don't want you to create uh, World War Three in the chat box, but you might be surprised. I mean, let me take one that I've done in the past. Okay, so one I've done in the past was marriage. So I put marriage down in the live audience session, and I've sort of said, okay, what's the very first thing that comes to mind with marriage? And you get what I consider the obvious, because it's obviously my mind and thinking: um, faithfulness, friendship, partnership, loyalty. Um, you know. I, all of that. And then you know, it took me back the first couple of times I did it because I was like, I got the response of, you know, um, avoid at all costs and um, devastating, heartbreaking. And I was like, wait, hang on a sec. Now I've been happily married for 22 years. Um, I, you know, I'm one of those that dated my high school sweetheart and just been lucky. But you can suddenly see, well, you know, parents, children from divorced homes or, um, people that have had bad experiences, maybe they've had an issue themselves, their first thought that came to mind. The other one that I've done is like career um, or money. And when the room, when you're in a room talking about this to people, I mean, I know my grandfather always said, never talk about sex, religion, politics, um, and never lend out your lawnmower, your car or your wife. Um, and the reason for that is because it, it gets to be controversial even more so now than in the past. But when you do it in a live audience and you sort of throw this out and people look across the room and go like, really? Is that what you see it as being? I mean, I've had, you know, so you put out money and people say security and freedom and other people like the root of evil. Um, and, you know, 
that people just suddenly start to see that different beliefs are in the room. Okay. Um, it's just a very interesting exercise. Okay. Um, to have. And <laughs> that is why I say test your subconscious privately. Um, because it's, it can be quite controversial, but if you sit down with some friends and some people in a safe space and you test it, you might, you'll, you'll find, are you, you know, the people around you, do they think like you or possibly you might find some surprises in that. Okay. The point of all of this is that these belief systems are there for a reason and um, it's biological. Okay, it is absolutely biological that we've evolved and, and developed these belief systems and these judgments. So ethics is the language of judgments. I'll talk about that in a bit. Where we have to make these snap judgments and it can be quite pre prejudicial, possibly the cliched, because if we had to evaluate constantly all the data that hits us on a daily basis, we, we would be exhausted. We would be gibbering idiots because it would just be too much for us to cope with. But instead, from when we were little, growing up, we saw circumstances, certain situations happen often enough that eventually we don't have to go through the full experience to know the outcome or to, to assume the outcome. We will just start to see the beginning of the experience and go, okay, this is what's going to happen. At the same time, those generational beliefs that have been handed to us, at some point in our history, somebody got chased by a lion. We don't have to be chased by a lion to know that lions are dangerous. Okay. And it's not a good idea to go play with a lion. Some people have to learn things from first experience. We were told when we were little that the stove was hot. Don't touch the stove. It's hot. Some of you had to go touch the stove to figure it out for yourself. But I believe you, you touched it once and you didn't touch it again. And then, you know, okay, there's a stove. It's on. It'll be hot. So that is how the same belief systems get set up, okay, that certain situations, certain things are just like, okay, well, I see this, therefore, that's the situation. And it's the way our subconscious works so that we can navigate life, okay. It's also why you get this sort of physical feeling when you're triggered, because what you have assumed in your subconscious, if you get something that's different to it, and it doesn't make sense, you feel uncomfortable, okay. We, we use it basically for survival. But the problem is we need to just also, as much as it's a gut instinct and automatic sub, you know, subconscious thinking, it comes with some warnings. Okay, so it definitely impacts on our behavior because I'm not gonna go put my hand on the stove. I know it to be hot. I'm gonna stay in the game ranger vehicle because those lions are dangerous. Okay, so the way that I communicate, the way that I behave, the way that I act, the way that I carry myself, um, possibly my facial expressions, that all is driven by a belief system. Okay, it can lead to anxiety, fear, and conflict. So, again, when I'm in a situation that goes against my beliefs, you're going to get that oily, squirmy, horrible feeling or going to get upset because you're in a situation that is against your beliefs. It's, a, it's not in line with where you're at or what you're feeling and you're going to struggle with it. That's where dilemma comes from. So, you know, for example, like I said, long married, I believe in faithfulness, I believe in fidelity. And then if I had a friend come to me and would be like confiding in me that she's having an affair that goes against everything I believe okay that is going to create conflict that is not a that is not something I want to know that is not a place I want to be in um I'm going to now have a conflict between loyalty to my friend and you know knowledge that her husband is in a, a situation so what do you do with it it creates a dilemma okay um it can turn to automatic thinking that can cause us to act impulsively in case of operating unconsciously. First thing out your mouth might not be very, you know, um, politically correct. Um, you could say something in anger, you could withdraw, you could 
you know, you could literally physically or, or uh, um, react in some way. And how many of you have had to apologize after and say, I'm so sorry that I didn't mean that it just came out, okay? Because you've had that emotive automatic reaction, okay? Because ethics is emotional, it's reactive. It, it comes from that space. It's not calm, cool, and collected, okay? When somebody challenges your beliefs, you get defensive, okay? This is what I know. This is what's true. And it, and it takes a very mature person to stop and say, okay, why do you believe that? Or is this really the ultimate truth, okay? What is the perspective that I'm looking at? I'm going to give you a break in a second. I just want to get to a certain point, and then it'll be a good break. These notes are not... Sorry, there's, I did change something, so I'm just, um, you know what, um, Anna, you might actually be right. Okay. Um, you, you've made me realize something. So I think let's take a break here, and I'm just going to chat in the background, um, and I thought that the notes were similar, but they were different. And I've just hit a section where the notes should be different and they're the same. So let's take a 10 minute break. Um, let's come back at 10 past and um, let me see what I can do about this. Thanks everyone. I'll see you in 10 minutes.
Um, one of the things that I always say is when you've made a mistake, you admit, admit your error. Um, and uh, it definitely something is something went uh, wrong in the ether last night when we were uploading slides. Um, so Anita or Anna, I couldn't quite see your name clearly. Uh, you earn the champion award prize. Um, if I could, I'd send you a chocolate because you actually were absolutely right that the slides were wrong. Um, and uh, so <laughs> we've actually uploaded the, the correct slides. I'm so sorry for it. Um, but I will catch up and, and explain to you the, the differences. This is a slide that was supposed to trigger in my head um, to talk to you about the 357 um, discussion about your, your moral compass um, and, you know, to talk to the fact that um, our moral compass is really starts to be formed at the age of three. And that's, I always have a chuckle when I see the slide, you know, this is where my line started. Um, any of you that uh, remember sort of having to say what books you had read when you had read it. Uh, some of us read more than we should have, but some of you, this was a total task. Um, and, you know, maybe it wasn't quite what it should have been. Um, and that should be my first clue that I didn't see that slide. Um, a really something we've discussed here, there's nothing in the world that can trouble you more than your own thoughts. So it's thinking about being challenged, um, whether or not we are happy with who we are, what we are, our behavior. Um, I think if you are ethically tuned in, um, you know, much like my conversation about uh, stay-at-home moms, you say something and then, you know, it bothered me for the rest of the night as to how I came across. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to be that way, but that's how it sounded. And then it made me question whether or not, you know, where I was at with this thought process, maybe there was something subconscious that was coming out. And my friend's response to me really shook me up. And um, I felt this need to actually apologize to her afterwards. And so I said, this wasn't really how I saw myself um, but thank you, really, for that indication. So we've had the conversation, but um, my, my slides were supposed to trigger me. Here was something that was not discussed, but just something that I included in the slides was actually to go to the dictionary and say what ethics are, okay? And that ethics, you know, one definition of it is the, the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the, uh, or the conducting of activity. So it's what drives how we behave. It drives action. Okay, the branch of knowledge that deals with moral principles. We're going to talk to ethical theory today. Code of moral principles and values that directs the behavior of an individual or group as to what's right or what's wrong. Code of ethics sets the standards about what is good or bad behavior and provides guidance for decision making. Um, so I think you can see none of this is that law makes us do it. It's all very much um, around right from wrong, decision-making, evaluating, and action and behavior. Okay, so we've really done that. Um, I always just found this to be, I can always tell that that's the accountant in the front middle row. Um, the question as to why is ethics important to today's society and then everybody's cheating on him. Um, it's, it's really taking responsibility. It's being accountable. Um, it's living the best life you can live. And if all of us are striving towards that common good, I think, you know, society can only benefit. But um, I think we have touched on that. And um, you can sort of see why I sort of thought they were similar, um, but not quite, because I had sort of added some meat to the slides. Um, and that's why I was uh, a little bit confused as to <laughs> whether or not the slides are the same or not. Uh, and I will admit my mistakes and take ownership of it. Um, it's exactly what I'm telling you we should be doing in the session. Okay. Um, and here I've actually got different um, challenges, uh, unlike the ones before. Um, where do ethics come from? This is why I knew that the other slides were wrong because I had a diagram in the other slides of that tree of, you know, that we are influenced by our family, we are influenced by school, the community we live in, um, our religious backgrounds, um, sports, culture, um, social media, TV, books we read, our friends, okay? 
Um, friends, I found, you know, again, another quote is, you know, if you, uh, if you surround yourself with five millionaires, you'll be the sixth. If you surround yourself with five uh, geniuses, you'll be the sixth. If you surround yourself with five idiots, you'll be the sixth. You know, this whole idea that you are a, uh, you're the sum of the five closest, the five people closest to you. Uh, and I think if you think about it, you know, you reflect, you sort of rub off on each other and you sort of all become each other. And there's that influence that sometimes you need to start questioning whether or not this is who I want to be. Okay. If you are the most clever person in the room, I think it's time to change rooms because you want to learn from others. Um, we develop a sophisticated set of evaluations that are applied to situations as such uh, as the degree of goodness or badness, short versus long-term effects, the scope of our impact. Okay. Um, and we become socialized. So that socialized in just in your workplace um, or within your friends group, there's unwritten rules as to what you do and what you don't do. Uh, and when you're new to a group of friends or when you're new to um, a, a certain situation and everybody does something and you're like, well, who told you to do that? Where did, how did you know that this is what we do and how we behave? Um, and eventually you learn those unwritten rules and you learn what is, what is good and what is bad. Ethics are also derived from what you were rewarded for and what you were punished for. Okay. Um, and that's why this picture also now it makes a bit more sense because although we have all these influences, although we've had this history, that doesn't, we still are cognitive human beings that can choose our future. We can choose what we do with it. Um, hmm, this one is just totally where I'm at at the moment. There's nothing wrong with being wrong to err as human. It becomes a problem when you choose to stay wrong and deny the error with willful blindness. New information is an invitation to question old opinions. The faster we recognize your mistakes, the less wrong you are. And um, I could have carried on with the old slides all the way and sort of, or I could actually have updated them to the ones that needed to come. But also with this one, this is where we get to cognitive dissonance. Um, when you're presented with fact, absolute indisputable fact, and you hold on to your old, your old belief. Okay. Um, and something inside you, like grates, like sandpaper, you just are not comfortable or happy, but you can't let go of your belief. It's so entrenched and so absolutely true to you. So like a flat earth society where it's, you know, you've been taught all your life the earth is flat, but then you get a picture from the moon or the sphere. Like, you know, to me, it's, this is sort of like where conspiracy theorists and all the rest come from. So even when they produce fact, they can't believe it. There has to be some reason why that's that. It's not what is true. And that's what we call cognitive dissonance, where your body is trying to tell you that this is wrong, but your mind is just holding on to what you what you want to believe. And that's a big trigger. It's a big thing to, for you to look at. Okay. Um, um, Garth, the slides, actually, if you look above my previous comments, you'll see that there's a a PDF that's been put into the comment chat, and that is the new updated slides. So the new updated slides have actually been put into the chat box, and um, so that you can download from there, uh, and you can and you have them um, in your in your notes straight away. So there are two sets of slides that have been put into the chat box. The last set, which is literally just above my comment about uploaded um, uh, updated slides uploaded, is the latest slides. Um, for you. As you can see, there's just a couple of extra slides and a couple of additional pieces of information. So what we have here and what I'm hoping to really instill or, or to get you to, to think about, we are not walking impulses. So as much as I, I said, we have got instincts and we've got gut responses and we've got, uh, we've developed the subconscious over time. And with all this information that we've been taught how and what and when to do things, we are not slaves to it. Okay. And I, and I, and I will add that this depends on circumstances and time frames, but we need to question what we know. We need to question our perspective. And as we get more information and as we get, you know, have these, uh, these difficult conversations and um, uh, curious conversations, and we get to see other perspectives and other sides to the arguments, 
we need to say, okay, well, do we need to adjust our thinking or not? You know, the, the other argument could be, in our minds, totally foolish. Um, and then we're like, no, we actually, we believe we're on the, the right side here. Or sometimes you listen to that person and go like, well, that makes sense. Okay. I love having a conversation, just it's like a party trick, where you talk to people about pink tax. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people have never heard about pink tax. And you sort of say to them, well, have you ever noticed, or have you ever thought about the fact that as women, we get marketed to and the pricing of our products, um, just because they're marketing to women, is far more expensive than men. I mean, the classic example is body wash. I mean, men, you, you get a body wash that washes your hair, washes you, can most probably wash your car and wash everything, and, and it's 30 bucks. And women, we get marketed that we get a, a cream that washes our left eyebrow. Um, and, you know, just look at a woman's vanity and look at everything that we've been told to believe that we need a cleanser, a toner, now serums, moisturizer. Um, we can't just wash our hair. We have to condition and put a mask in. Um, all of these things that we've been told, um, never mind the whole social conditioning of grooming and everything else like that. But that all costs a fortune. Our shampoos do not cost 30 bucks. Our shampoos cost a lot more, um, but it's marketed to women. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you start questioning, like, do I need to use that shampoo or can I use my husband's? I mean, some of your husband's using yours and that's why he's got such fantastic locks. Um, but anyway, so don't believe everything you think. You know, don't, sometimes we need to challenge our beliefs and ask ourselves, is this really true? Is this really working for us? Is this necessary? So Viktor Frankl, um, this quote of his, and it's a rather specific quote, this quote of his is world famous. It's most probably the one that's attributed to him and is most recognized as being his quote. For those of you who don't know Viktor Frankl, he is a phenomenal man to look up. If you, this, those of you that enjoy biographies and things like that, he is really interesting to read about. He is a Auschwitz survivor uh, from the concentration camps in World War II, and he became a psychologist that was interested in trauma. His observation in the concentration camps was that all of them were going through the same experience, okay, which is horrific, absolutely horrifying um, and traumatic. But some people broke and were destroyed and other people came out stronger. And so it's the same as that analogy about, you know, people got it, the hot water. So the experience is hot water, but an egg gets hard and a potato gets soft. So, you know, the same experience, but depending on your makeup or your whatever it is that you are some of us are potatoes and some of us are eggs and he was very interested in this whole idea so his quote goes between stimulus and response stimulus being the hot water and the way we respond to it there is a space and in that space is our power to choose our response in our response lies our growth and our freedom so this is where I ask him, up and say to my son, change the narrative. You can have something happen to you, which is unpleasant, horrible, or whatever it is. You can react. You can be emotional. Think about road rage on the road. Or you can pause and say, do I really feel like that? Is that really how I want to behave? Is that really what, how I want to respond to this? Maybe I'm putting onto that person something that isn't true. Maybe this, there's a different circumstance, a different option that could be happening here, and I can choose to respond in a different way. And I actually could choose them to respond in a way that actually makes my life better, makes their life better. I don't regret it later. But the power is with me to choose. But it's in that moment that I pause. Okay, I say it's time dependent because if you're walking down the road and you hear footsteps behind you, uh, especially as a woman, I'm going to run and get to safety. It might be my friend trying to catch up with me for a lift. I don't know that at that moment. My gut and my instincts are saying danger. Um, someone else might not. Someone else might stop and look and see, well, what's going on here? Um, but in that moment, you know, you've got, your, you've got to choose your response. We are not victims to ourselves. We actually can control our thoughts. Um, why do we even bother to do this? Well, I just think that it, we, we all want to live in a better place. We want, our, we want to leave a better place for the next generation. We want to be proudly South African and be proud of our country. We want to take our country back for ourselves, I think, um, 
and and sleep well at night and have an, and be known to have integrity. So there's so many reasons why we want to do this. As I've said already, language ethics is a language of judgment. Okay, um, it's the language of ought, should, would. Okay, you ought to have done this. You should have done this. I would have done it. Okay. Um, it means that you're putting on what you would have done and judging other people for what they did. But we have to understand that what we see and what they see is not necessarily the same thing. The, you know, there's another quote somewhere that says the, you know, the biggest problem people have is uh, thinking that everybody else sees the world the same as they do. Okay. Um, hold yourself to that high standard. Uh, that's, that's part of this. Um, teach people how to treat you as well. I've got one colleague that was chatting to me and saying that she came from a very aggressive workplace um, where there was a lot of swearing and a lot of shouting and a lot of, uh, you know, very, very aggressive um, atmosphere that she worked in. And she, she really didn't enjoy it. It didn't sort of suit who she was. She's a very quiet and conservative person. And she went into a new workspace and she wasn't going to make a big deal about this, but she was like, okay, this is an opportunity to reset the clock. And all she did was put a swear jar on her desk. She didn't make a fuss about it. She just put a swear jar on her desk. And people came by and they would, they would cuss. And then they would see them go, oh, sorry. And they put a random or whatever it is. And it got to be known, don't swear around her. Because it makes her uncomfortable. And it was a bit of a joke, like, oh, yeah, you know. But she taught people that that was behavior she didn't accept. Okay. If you're always answering the phone at seven o'clock at night from clients, the clients are always going to phone you at seven o'clock at night. You teach people how to treat you. What do you tolerate? People will continue doing. And that's the whole discussion about boundaries. Um, boundaries are healthy. Um, people only get upset with your boundaries when they've benefited from you not having any. Anyway, so where does all of this come from? Now, Ethical theories, people make a career and a lifetime out of them, and you get African ethics, Western ethics, Eastern ethics, you get um, business ethics and um, religious ethics and professional ethics and all different categories of ethics and all different um, spectrums of ethics. Okay, But when you get to ethical theories, it's that systematic way of analyzing what should or shouldn't be done. Okay, The broadest split is consequentialism versus non-consequentialism and i know i've spoken to you in the last week about this but this is some detail on it okay so you're either at the heart of you regardless as to whether you're dealing with western or eastern or african ethics or whatever it might be at the heart of you that compass that was set at two or three okay learned at that point that you're either a non-consequentialist or a consequentialist. Now, let's take care of the consequentialists first. Okay. This goes way back to 5 BC for, for um, based on a Chinese philosopher that, that sort of looked at this. Okay. Um, they looked at the consequence, not the process. So a consequentialist will look at the ends justifies the means. They don't place value on what you, you know, what the, the toing and froing in your head. They place value on the greater good at the end. Okay. So it's by the results. So this these are the people that say the ends justifies the means. The ends justifies the means. That is what they are um, on about. Okay. The quality of the consequence or the outcome depends on how much good they can contain. So the greater good. Okay. If they can increase happiness and prevent suffering, and it's the best consequence over time, at the time, that one they're happy with. So for example, to me, this is a very medical way of thinking because side effects are acceptable. Um, there will be a certain loss of life with new treatments or with disease or whatever. But so long as that treatment in the, the greater scheme does more good than less, then they're happy with it. They, you know, they can live with that. Okay. 
Um, utilitarianism by uh, Jeremy Bentham. He's sort of the face of this, okay? Um, so they're looking at how much happiness, how much pleasure, how much benefit is produced versus how much suffering and struggle is reduced, okay? Ultimate good. Um, they want to be useful. So utilitarianism is to be of service, to be useful, okay? Um, they're looking also for everyone involved. So it's very much around, like I said, the consequence. So we have a, 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 an example that we often use in ethics here that is the trolley example. And we started to, to, to look at how people value things and how people look at things. And the trolley example, if you look it up um, on Google, you can see the videos and you can see the way that it's worked. But essentially what we say to people and we set the scene is to say that a train, you know, a train is going down the tracks and there's a split. And you have got the lever to send the train left or right. And on the one side, you have four people. And on the other side, you have one person. And you need to decide which way the train is going. Now, the laugh is often that the accountant step back and say, look, this is not my thing. It's too high risk. Exit, um, step away from the lever. I'm not doing this. And then I'll explain that later when we get into professional ethics as to why we go like that. But generally, you know, people say, well, it's better to take out one person than four people. That's a consequentialist thinking. Okay. And then we start playing with you with this example and start saying, well, that one person is your husband and the four people are criminals or this or that or the next thing. And I promise you, people are very bloodthirsty. They have swing that lever backwards and forwards in all directions. Um, it's interesting, though, because then we change the example and we say to you, well, now you've got this four, this one, but they're standing on a bridge and you need to push them. And people are like, the ones that were happily swinging the lever, they definitely step back and say, no, we can't do that. So when it was a lever and there was distance, it was much easier to do it. But when you actually physically had to push the person, most people were like, no, that's, that's getting a bit personal now. Okay. But consequentialism is they value the outcome. So in the financial world, I sort of see this maybe more in sort of the financial director CFO space, um, you know, saving people's jobs, um, looking at the outcome, looking at the, the, the greater good um, and valuing that and, and maybe having to do some things that they might not be proud of, but they find it necessary they, in their heads. They're justifying it as necessary in order to, to get there. Okay. Um, two different approaches to this. The direct approach, consider the direct effect actions may have on others and ways in which to maximize benefit. Indirect approach. What would happen if everyone acted in accordance with the rule of conduct? So if everybody did the same thing, what would happen if everyone acted in accordance with the opposite? So what would happen if everybody obeyed the speed limit on the roads? What happens if nobody obeyed the speed limits on the roads? Okay. Which would be the better outcome? Okay. Consequentialists. Non-consequentialists, we don't work this out by the consequence. We work this out by the process. Okay. So the con we don't take the consequence into account in valuing whether this is a good decision or not. Whatever comes of this, comes of this. If we lose the client, we lose the client. If we... Um, you know, if, if this happens, it happens. That's what happens. It's, we're going to, if whistleblowing and we land up with this problem, well, that's, that's just what happens, okay? But the action itself is what we look at, okay? So morality is determined by a higher authority. You know, many of us, I mean, I, I have to say it, I say it to my son, don't worry about what the other person does. They have to answer to their maker. You have to answer to your maker, okay? Um. So being accountable, whether you're accountable to your family, whether you're accountable to your spouse, whether you're accountable to the higher authority that you believe in, okay? A sense of duty, um, the nature of the thing, love, virtue, so um, the right thing to do, intuition, 
So it's the process that we value without worrying about the outcome. Okay. The source of morality comes before the act is done. So we think about this before we act. It's not the outcome of the act that we value. It's the consideration beforehand. So this is where we talk about value ethics. We talk about the golden rule. We talk about duty ethics. Because you do your duty regardless as to the outcome. If you are um, a first responder, if you are in the military armed forces, there's a duty to protect. That duty may result in you having to fire, you know, to kill someone in defense. But your duty was to protect. It's more, it's bigger than you are. Okay. So in unpacking this, the common ones, and you'll start to see our code of conduct works. The common one here is virtue ethics. And I think almost all the accountants I meet, we are non-consequentialists and we do aspire to a form of virtue ethics or um, especially if your ethical space has come from a spiritual space or a religious space, um, which I think as South Africans in general, we are quite conservative. Um, and, and for most part, we are instilled in this way of thinking. I'm not saying all, uh, but it's, it does seem to be that way. And, and I tend to, to trip over virtue ethics and non-consequentialist ethics people as professional accountants more so than maybe I would see maybe in the lawyers or in the medical field or somewhere else. Okay. So here, as a virtue ethics person, we have a commitment to being a good and virtuous person. So at our heart, when we wake up in the morning, um, we want to be a good person. We see ourselves as being good people. Um, yes, we're going to have dilemmas. Yes, we're going to have struggles. Yes, we are going to fail. We are human. But we're continually striving to be this better version of ourselves. Okay. Concerned with character and less with actions or rules. So it's the principle of the thing. It doesn't matter if it's 10 rand. It doesn't matter if it's 10 million rand. It's the principle of thing. I saw a lovely one that says character is who you are. Reputation is who people think you are. <laughs> um, but your character is yours. And it's what you value about yourself. So what do you pride yourself in being? Um, what do you pride? You know, what? so like I was saying earlier, to me, the values that are important to me are honesty. It's friendship. It's loyalty. It's fidelity. Okay, it's trustworthiness, um, integrity. Okay, these are things that I hold dear. These are things that if nobody else knows about it, I'm going to strive to be the best person. And, and if there are challenges to those, then that makes me uncomfortable. Okay, it's one of the things that personally I have as a, a challenge in prof my profession is that I've got a very strong sense of loyalty. So when I have, you know, I feel loyal to people, but then professionally, I need to be objective and distant from them. That's a struggle for me. Um, character defines the person. You build your virtues through continuous practice of behaving virtuously. So we are always striving. We, we are not perfect. Okay. Um, up until the day we go to meet our maker, up until the day that we stop breathing and, and life is done, we are still striving to be better than we were. And we, we are never going to be that purely virtuous person. I think all of us know that. But every day, we know we, we will trip. We know that we'll slide backwards. But we'll get up each day and try and move forward. The one truth to this, and the one thing that really strikes me, is that people that follow virtue ethics or follow non-consequentialist thinking, they can't be different people. Because if, you, if you're doing ethics and valuing ethics on action, well, you can behave differently in different circumstances because you're evaluating things by the action. The outcome is what's important. But if you're doing it by the process, well, I'm going to behave in the same way as a daughter, as a mother, as a wife, as a sister, as a friend, and as a business colleague. I can't be different people in different circumstances. So, you know, they, these are also the people that say, well, Karen's always Karen. People, you know, people that know me will know that they get me as I am. Um, 
I don't, this is who I am and this is who I am regardless of the circumstances you put me in. It does mean people can trust you more because they know what they're getting. Okay. You're not a fair weather friend or you're not this or that because you can't be different yous. There is only one you of you. And you're the same in all circumstances. Okay. Um, that's sort of what speaks to virtue ethics. What does it mean to have a virtue? Reliable habits that are engraved into your identity. Habits that direct you towards what's good. So habits are things that you do subconsciously. Habits are things that you have practiced over and over again until you don't think about it. So virtue ethics, if you know the teller gives you more change than you were supposed to have, you don't think twice about saying to them, wait, hang on a sec, you've given me too much. Here's what you need. Somebody was telling me a story about where they got to take a lot of deliveries and they got a gar they ordered a Garmin watch and the, the, the watch came in a separate package from because it's coming from a separate place. And then they got the rest of the order in another package. But when they opened the rest of the order, they had got another Garmin watch. Now, some people would say like, oh, bonus for me. And this person, I know her well, was like, didn't even think twice. Phone take a lot and said, you sent me two watches. Okay. Honesty and integrity. Um, holistic view excellence and virtue in all aspects of life so always striving to be better always striving to do the right thing okay professing not just professing values but the actions follow and um, how you feel think and what you see and how you act um it all is the same you don't just because it's easier to do it this on one day and not on another day you don't look and change you do what is right whether it's hard or easy it's the right thing to do okay leads to good judgment without needing rules so this is where it comes to not rule based i don't need rules to act the way i need to act because i follow principles yes there's judgment but the principles guide me okay principles guide me without me needing a rule book just think about a code of conduct a code of conduct is a professional principle based code Okay, so if you know what integrity looks like, if you know what um, due care and, and professional behavior looks like, if you know what objectivity feels like, you don't need to be told how to be objective or what the rules are. Okay. One of the most common non-consequentialist schools of thought and virtue ethics schools of thought is the golden rule. Okay, it's known as the golden rule. There has been tremendous amount of research done on the golden rule. And um, somebody did a, I think it was a PhD thesis, where they studied all the formal religions. Um, and formal from Christianity and uh, Islam and uh, Hindu and all those, all the way down to Wicca. And in studying all of these formal religions, they discovered that every single one had a variation of this okay and we teach it to our kids because it's short clear and simple so do unto others as you'd have them do unto you in christianity we say love thy neighbor like you'd love yourself um, and i'm sure those of you that come from different religious backgrounds you could give me the version that comes from your um belief system so but it all comes down to the same thing that you want to treat other people the way you want to be treated so what do we say to our kids? Well, you know, don't kick sand in Tommy's eye because you wouldn't like Tommy to kick sand in your eye. It's quite simple. Okay. It builds on motivations and feelings that people already have. You don't want to be treated that way. You don't want to feel that way. So don't make other people feel that way and don't treat other people that way. Obvious, immediate, practical. Okay. And then it has that basic human appeal to maintain civilized society, that everybody treats each other with respect, everybody treats each other with kindness, everybody's aware. It does have a problem, which I'll get to in a bit. Okay. But um, so how does the rule work? How does the golden rule work? Test your proposed action towards others by seeing how that action would feel if it was you on the receiving end. So don't kick sand into Tommy's eye because how would I feel if Tommy kicks sand into my eye? But there's the belief that the other person's interests are similar and of as much importance as your own. Okay. 
Now, I'm hoping that that will ring a bit of an issue with you, okay? Um, because do we know how the other person wants to be treated? Yes or no, maybe. Have we asked? Okay, so I've got this, this. Okay, so I'll take it again. This is personal ethics. What about the five love languages that they talk about? So just to, to give you an example of how this could be problematic. You know, they talk about there's the acts of service, there's physical affection, there's gifts. Um, I think there's validation. There's, there's different five different love languages, whatever they are. So if you are a physical affection person, so you feel loved when you, when people hug you and kiss you and, and are physically affectionate towards you. But your spouse is acts of service. So they feel loved or, or they show love by making tea, making sure that you've, you know, you've got a warm coat for the day, um, making sure that you are, uh, you know, that they've thought about your favorite meal, that they are of service to you, okay? So now you're in a relationship and you are showing your love to your spouse by being physically affectionate. And they think, you know, they're like, for heaven's sake, just leave me alone. I've just had enough. I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. Maybe they're an introvert. And they're showing their love to you by making sure you've got a cup of coffee and, and making sure that, you know, you've got your breakfast and that you've got lunch packed or whatever it might be. You thinking, flip, you know, I just wish you'd give me a hug uh, or just wish that, um, should be a bit more affectionate to me, hold my hand in public or whatever it is. And she's busy thinking, flip, you know, um, I just want to sit on the couch and read my book. She's thinking, you know what? I would just like somebody to make me a cup of tea. I would just like somebody to think of me um, and maybe one day do this for me or do or sort this out for me. And there's a disconnect between the two because neither one feels like the other one is showing them what they want to receive. Okay. So that is one of the challenges here is that you say do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, but the other person might not want what you're giving and would want to receive something else. So the one thing I always sort of speak to people is like the way it leaves you is not necessarily how it lands. Okay. Um, and this is where that curiosity comes into play again by being respectful about how other people view things, how other people see things, how other people feel about things, and making a small adjustment. Um, so that your act of kindness, your act of um, well, good intention, actually lands in that in that way, and not is not misinterpreted or, or seen in a different way. Okay. So they talk about the concept of reversibility. So if I was the recipient, would I want to have that done to me? Okay. Um, but then I need to know where the other person stands. Um, as a thought. Okay. Know yourself, know where you are at, but then also think about the other person. The other one that comes through is uh, Kantian ethics, which is really about duty ethics. Okay, so uh, theoretical principles determined by practical reasoning. Um, you have a duty to achieve good. So Kantian ethics is often sort of like an armed services and that. Um, what's good, your reasoning works that out. Ability to reason common to all people. So we have this ability to be reasonable and to be not emotional, but sort of think about, okay, so we need to protect our borders. We need to protect our country. Therefore, we need to defend it. Um, and therefore, these acts need to occur in order to defend our country. Okay. We are reasonable. Pure reasoning is the source of morality. No law, no consequence, not virtue ethics, none of that. Okay. It is simply being analytical about what needs to be done okay you have an obligation to do the right thing moral action has to be done voluntarily so it's not imposing this on someone else you know people so conscription could be a bit of a challenge but you know most places it's a voluntary sign up you you volunteer to act in the police you volunteer to sign up for the military forces in most parts of the world only a few parts have a conscription okay so you choose to do this. You know in yourself that you believe in God and country, okay? And you believe in whatever it is that you're doing, and you have a duty to make this happen, okay? Um, you have an obligation to do the right thing. A moral action has to be done voluntarily. Okay, uh, it's a conscious action. 
principle a uh, people and actions are moral when they achieve good okay so your action or people are good when they do good um so only act only according to the rule which can be a universal law for all peoples and all circumstances so very much law based okay universal law of nature work out the principle behind your action try to imagine the world where everybody lived that principle ask yourself whether a world could exist in which everybody lived in that principle so you are saying that for the world to be a good and healthy place everybody must follow this rule and um, not for everybody not an easy idea or thought just to we'll pick this up again in business ethics but just to start introducing you to this idea in the last few minutes we come across um people that the way they're behaving the way they're acting is not ethical okay and when you sit and speak to them they honestly don't seem to acknowledge that their behavior is unethical it could be a situation of different belief systems and different ways of viewing things but often they just simply have packed the ethics away they simply they can't almost afford to look at the ethical issue and they are choosing to fade the ethics out um, and convince themselves that what they're doing is not unethical and, and we'll like i said we'll pick this up a bit more in the business ethics session but what I want you to just dwell on this, but and it's uh, Kenny Wong and Simon Sinek that do a lot of work on this. It's also called um, moral disengagement. Okay, so you'll you'll see it referred to as moral disengagement. But people start using fancy euphemisms. Um, people start sort of you know they don't talk about bribery. They talk about inducements or gifts. They talk about a tender procurement fee rather than bribery. Um, that, you know, my students, I used to tease them because they used to tell me that, no, no, Prof Maitland, we are not cheating. We are doing collaborative learning. You know, collaborative learning is good. And I'm like, not in this situation. This was a test. Um, and does your colleague know that you're collaboratively learning off them? Um, companies don't spy on you. They data mine. Um, armed, you know, special forces don't do, inter you know, they don't torture people. They do advanced interrogation techniques. So when things are dressed up as euphemisms, and I'm sure you could think of many, that's a warning sign. When, when people can't just say exactly what they're doing, when people can't call a spade a spade and they're wanting to call it some fancy other thing, just to remove themselves from their actions so that their mind can actually say that it's okay to do this because it's not what people think it is. We are in the space of ethical fading. The other thing is that they're rationalized. So everybody else is doing it. And if I don't do it, I won't be competitive. You know, I need to, I need to feed my, my staff, I need to pay my staff, and therefore that's why I'm doing this. Um, so even though it's very clear that the action, this is the action that needs to happen, they are excusing it and rationalizing it so that they they justify in their heads why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and if you land up in that space, that's why it gets very difficult to have certain conversations because. And they're just not there. Okay. Um, so to wrap up today's session, I hope you found it useful. I hope you've it's been thought provoking is really what I want. Um, and and I hope you are you sort of sitting thinking about what type of ethics you have, where it's come from, where you can maybe improve because we can always improve. Um, I'm, I hope I didn't touch too many sore spots, but also it's quite fun to start looking around you and going, ah, oh, there's a consequentialist. Ah, there's a non-consequentialist. Um, just to 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 raise awareness, okay. Um, and when you have those uh, itchy spots at the back of your head, and when you start to feel a bit squirmy about certain things, it's just an invitation to reflect and ask yourself, how is this an opportunity to do better? Um, how can I be better next time? How can I not, you know, how can I I, I sit more comfortably in my skin about certain things? Um, and that's really what I'm hoping you achieve from today's session. So on the dots of 11 o'clock, uh, I hope I saved the situation um, from having the wrong notes to the right notes. Um, the assessments are available. Um, so please get that sorted out. 
uh, you always challenge me to to think of how to assess something on, along these lines. It's much easier to assess a technical issue. Um, but I do hope it was useful and I hope that um, I got you thinking. And I'm really looking forward to unpacking business ethics. Um, you know, the, the ethical culture and corporate governance um, in a business space. And that's the next session to come up. So good luck, enjoy, and I look forward to seeing you soon. If you have any other questions, please use the chat. If you would like to email a question, please email to technicalquestions at accountingacademy.co.za. Thank you for your participation. We hope to see you next time.